Hello, 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 and welcome back to the travel adventures of Mr. Sneaky Duck and Edgar Allan Crowe, Kyoto, Osaka, Part 3, ebook, page 11. Here are some notes that when we start going over the new information, you may want to look at. You just click on that and they'll pop open in another tab. Today's agenda, we're going to read aloud, think aloud. We're going to talk about what we learned last time, briefly, because it is very associated with what we're talking about today. Uh, practice ethos, pathos, and logos. We're going to learn about the rhetorical triangle as it applies to some questions in your graphic organizer. We're going to talk about bias and slant. And then we're going to practice a little bit. So let's get started. From Kyoto to Osaka, in the Shinkansen bullet train. Edgar Allan Crow said that his father, Edgar Sr., told stories about a great-great-grandfather, Edogaru Kuro, that used to live on top of the Osaka Castle in Osaka, Japan. His father said that he lived there the last five years of the Edo period, a Japanese time period named for the royal family in charge. Edgar said that he could probably fly there in about 15 minutes. Just then, Mr. Duck yelled out, I don't have to fly. <laughs> I bet I can beat you there. The Shinkansen, or bullet train, goes about 250 miles per hour, and I can get there in 10... <laughs> Edgar Allen had a little fire in his big crow eyes and took him up on the bet. He said... I bet I can beat a train from Osaka to Kyoto any day. Well then, what's the bet? asked Sneaky. And Edgar, without hesitation, said, We get to go see the famous Kani Doraku restaurant on the famous walk Do Tonbori. The restaurant's name means dancing crab. Mr. Duck was terrified of crabs. And often had nightmares of a crab chasing him with its claws snapping down at his tail feathers. However, Mr. Sneaky Duck knew he could beat Edgar Allen and would never have to look at the giant crab snapping its claws. Mr. Duck agreed, but said that if he won, they would go to see the Kui Daore Taro or the Drumming Clown also famous on the Do Tonbori Street in Osaka. Edgar Allan Crow was terrified of the drummer. He said that it looked too much like the evil scarecrows people would put up to torment him in the cornfields of California. This is my wife, Yuki, and I, and there is the Kani, the crab. This is the crab that Mr. Duck is terrified to be near. Is the restaurant called Dancing Crab? So maybe you have to figure that out. In the quiz, however, let me give you a preview. There are claims everywhere here that you have to check. First, um, it says that his grandfather, Ed Dogaru Kuro, would live on in the castle at the Edo period. First of all, was the castle there during the Edo period? When was the Edo period? And is it possible for a great, great grandfather, maybe somebody in living in the 1800s, is that possible for them to be living there at that time? You have to research that. Edgar said that he could probably fly from Kyoto to Osaka in 15 minutes. You're going to have to figure out, first of all, how far is it from Kyoto to Osaka? Then you're going to have to find out how fast a crow can fly. And maybe if you can't find out a crow, you might be able to find out a bird in general, how, far, how fast birds can fly. And he says that his Shinkansen goes 250 miles an hour and can get to from Kyoto to Osaka in... 10 minutes. Is that true? You're going to have to research that. The next thing, it says that 
Kani Doraku means dancing crab. Is that true? You can research that. And I believe that's about it as far as the research goes. The research questions will be in the quiz and also some of these. We're going to talk a little bit more about ethos, pathos, and logos and get some practice. We're going to talk about something called soapstone and then bias and slant. All right, so let's look and see what we talked about last week or last time. We talked about these questions you have to ask yourself. Who wrote it? Where did it come from? What's the text trying to get me to do? What's missing? And what's the perspective? Well, these are from the notes last time if you want to look. In chapter, um, page 10 notes. So you ask yourself that anytime you look at a new text, which means video, article, even music. Then we went down and we talked about self-interest and how people usually uh, speak for themselves and their own interests when they're talking or when they're writing. They wouldn't, I mean, why would you talk for somebody else's interest? Sometimes people do because they're nice, but usually it's for your own interest that you give your opinion. And what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is convincing people through speaking or writing. And we went over the rhetorical triangle. So the speaker's job is to reach the audience for whatever purpose they have. So you have a, a relationship between the speaker, the audience, and the message. How is the author going to deliver that message in order to convince those people? And that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Ethos, remember is trying to convince people because you are qualified or you have experience. Pathos is trying to use emotion to get people to do what you need them to do or believe what you want them to believe or buy what you want them to buy. Logos is using logic. Because this does this, maybe you need to buy it. Or because this does this, maybe you need to start being that way. Or doing this or voting this way. So. Logic is often used, but people often make mistakes with logic, and we're going to talk about those logical fallacies next time. So, let's try some practice. As it says here, we're going to practice at those pathos and logos. I'm going to show you some short videos, and what I want you to do is quickly try to determine what they're using mostly. Are they using mostly ethos? Are they using mostly pathos or logos to convince you to do something? Let's look at this one first. I'm Dale Peterson, and I'm after the Republican nomination for Alabama Agriculture Commissioner. I've been a farmer, a businessman, a cop, a Marine during Vietnam. So I've been a cop, a businessman, a Marine. I've been a farmer, a businessman, a cop, a Marine during Vietnam, so listen up. Okay, why do I have to listen? Because he's been a farmer, a Marine, and a businessman, and all that nonsense? Well, is that because of ethos? Because he's qualified and has experience? Is it because emotionally I should do so? Or is it just logical that I should do it? If you said pathos, you're wrong. If you said logos, you're kind of wrong. If you said ethos, that's the best thing. He's trying to say why he's qualified for the job. Let's look at the next one. All right. It's amazing. Watch how OxyClean unleashes the power of oxygen, making tough stains disappear like magic without fading or bleeding the colors. For pet messes, OxyClean is a must. It goes deep down below the surface to get rid of the stain and the odor. Have you ever... So he's giving us reasons why we need to buy his product. And he's demonstrating rather than saying because of this reason and this reason and this reason. So if you had to decide, is it ethos? I'm qualified to wash clothes. Is it pathos? Now, they do use pathos in, in the music and everything is getting you exciting, excited, excuse me. But 
mostly if you said logos or logical it's logical because I need it it does this it fixes this it cleans this this way so if you said logos you're correct let's do one more and oh this is my least favorite commercial in the world because remember <laughs> I told you that people and institutions will sometimes try to make you do things and move you according to your emotion when your emotion has nothing to do with what they want you to do. Here's an example. Um, did Nana ever give you... Okay, Nana is their dead grandmother, okay? And she's it's her mother that he's talking about. Now also, if you're making this commercial, who in the world... I mean, this is, sounds kind of cynical, but who doesn't have a, a grandmother who's passed away? almost everybody except for very very young people okay that's unfortunate but it's just a fact of life so they know their audience is just about everyone who had a grandmother who's passed on and so they know that they can affect the feelings of those people because maybe they still hurt and they still miss their grandmother okay so what are they trying to sell me oh I don't know yet all I know is that something about a, a, a passed on grandmother. Let's rewind it because I talk so long. Mom, did Nana ever give you Cheerios when you were a little kid? Yeah, she did. Now, if you used different diction or different way of speaking, you would never reach your audience. What if it said, what if the boy said, hey, mom, did your dead mother ever eat Cheerios also? You know, that wouldn't pull at your heartstrings. You'd be like, wow, that's harsh. Are Cheerios the same back then? Cheerios has pretty much been the same forever. So when we have Cheerios, it's kind of like we're having breakfast with Nana. So they definitely wouldn't change the diction on that or the tone, and they wouldn't say, oh, and when we're having Cheerios, Mom, it's like we're having Cheerios with your dead mother. They wouldn't say that because it's too harsh. They want to have a sweet little boy that doesn't understand about death and how it may hurt his mother to talk about it right now. They want him to say it. But if it was an adult saying, hey, you know what? This is like we're eating with your dead mom. Isn't that great? You know, it, it wouldn't be as, as meaningful. And what they're using here, and I already told you the answer, is it ethos? Is it logical? That because... I mean, excuse me, is it logical that because your dead grandmother ate it that you have to eat it too? Is it emotional that, oh, my grandmother, oh, I miss her so much, I want to eat those right now? Or is it because that little boy is qualified to talk about people who passed away and ate things? If you said emotion, you are correct. Okay? And that's what I was talking about, people trying to move you to do things based on your emotion. And so what are we talking about here? Obviously, it's Cheerios. Yeah. She's like, I was having a good day before this. Yeah. So they're not selling love. They're selling Cheerios. But they're trying to get it, get at it through your love strings in your heart. Um, some of these things are also... You can look up the Beagle Freedom Project on your own. But here's what I want to tell you. Be careful of trying to use emotion because some people aren't always affected the same way emotionally. You have to be careful of the audience you're trying to capture because you may scare or, you know, not be able to reach your audience by what you choose to do through emotion. So this is supposed to be happy. Oh my gosh. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. What? Wow. Take it from Corinth. Wow. That terrifies me. I don't I don't care what he's selling. I don't want to buy it. That's me. The best breakfast under the big top is post sugar rice crinkles. So crinkly, so delicious, so Guess what? Sugar rice crinkles don't exist anymore. I think they had to change the name or something. 
Maybe those are Rice Krispies now. Why do you think they had to change the name? Maybe they scared more people than they helped. You know, yeah, come get it. And it scares away all the children. So be careful of the pathos that you use to try to reach your audience. Let's move on. What is bias? Let's look at the notes and you can click it, click them open if you haven't already. Bias is prejudice in favor or against one thing or person or group. Not really. I mean, if you look at it in real life, it's leaning one way completely or leaning the other way completely. It, let's say, let's talk about the election. If somebody always just talked about how wonderful Trump was and how horrible um, Mrs. Clinton is, then they are biased towards President Trump. If they talk about how wonderful um, Hillary Clinton is and how horrible Donald Trump is, then, of course, they're biased towards Hillary Clinton. Now, in bias, when you can tell somebody's biased, when they use a lot of slanted words, in other words, words that are just presenting, presented to show a certain point of view. Let me give you an example. So we're talking about Neil Gorsuch in this. It says he's a strong defender of religious liberty. A defender, that's a good word to call somebody a defender. But of course, this is Fox News, and it's a Republican-leaning news source. When we want to look at a Democrat-leaning news source, they say quite a lot of things, saying that, you know, he is he was nominated because he resembles a lab experiment, synthesizing every trend in conservative thought. So it's not really looking at him in a good way. They're using words that are slant, a lab experiment. When you think of a judge as a lab experiment, that is a slanted word or a group of words here to make us think in negative ways. If we go down here, it says that he is pro-abortion rights. He would oppose abortion rights. So any, any judge who opposes rights doesn't seem very much like a good judge. These are slanted. They're not extremely slanted, but they're slanted. If you look at the people for the ethical treatment of animals, they talk about why animals should have rights and everything it says victory persuading a circus to leave animals out of its show. Well, if they say victory in the headline, you already know how they feel, don't you? That's a very slanted word. If they just said, Arena persuades circus to leave animals out of its show, then you would have to read on to find out the information. Here, when it says victory immediately, that is slanted in the arena, in the area of, you know, supporting and loving animals. But I don't know who wouldn't see that as a victory. You know, maybe people who own circuses wouldn't like that because they couldn't have animals anymore. Let's move on. I told you a little bit about, and we're going to talk about more later, graphic organizer that can help me figure out who wrote something, where the text came from, what it's trying to get me to do, what's missing, what's the perspective, what, how is the author thinking. I want something that does that and helps me to figure out this rhetorical triangle, who is the speaker what's the audience and what's the message or the purpose of the message I want something that helps me figure that out and what soapstone is is a graphic organizer that can help you to do that so you look at this S stands for something O A P S and then tone 
So I would write this down to help me and then the answers to these questions will help you figure out that rhetorical triangle. What do I mean? Well, let's look back here. So you have the notes too. You can click on them and follow along if you want. Who is the speaker? So let's pretend like you're talking to whoever wrote it. This is what you're going to ask them and how you're going to try to figure it out. Who are you? What details will you reveal? Why is it important that the audience know who you are? In other words, are you a doctor or something? Is that why you're telling me who you are? And you're talking about health? What is the occasion? The occasion for birthday cake and ice cream is your birthday. The occasion for a Christmas tree is Christmas. How does your knowledge of the larger occasion, whatever's happening at the time, and the immediate occasion, whatever's happening now, affect what you're writing about? How, and remember, you're, you're talking to the author. You're trying to get these questions answered. Who is the audience? What are the characteristics of your audience? Are they younger? Are they older? Are they professional? Are they Democrat? Are they Republican? Are they pro-life? Are they pro-choice? What is your group? How are they related to you? Are you their teacher? Are you their servant? Why are you addressing them? This goes into the purpose as well. So how would you explain yourself as an author? How would you like your audience to respond to this? What do you want me to do because of what you are saying? What purpose are you writing this for or saying this? How do you want to affect me as a reader or listener? What's the subject? This is really just a few words usually. What are you talking about? I'm talking about freedom. I'm talking about equality. And what's the tone? What does that mean? What's your attitude, Mr. Writer or Speaker? How do you feel about what you're talking about? Um, and how do your attitudes you know, affect the way that you're talking about them? Are, are you slanted or biased? And then you can look at a few words or phrases that show how their attitude is. So those could be slanted words, or they could be just words showing emotion or an opinion one way or the other. So you write these things down, and you remember what they mean. Soapstone, S, speaker, O, occasion, A, audience, P, the purpose of the piece, S, the subject, and T, what's the tone? How are they talking? Don't forget that this is also diction. Diction is how you talk to people in certain categories, in certain ways. You don't talk to your friends the same way as you talk to the principal. Neither do I. Um, so that would be your diction. Um, syntax sometimes is the way that... Um, your sentences are. Are they very short or long sentences? Sometimes the short sentences, the author or the speaker is talking about things that aren't so important. And with long sentences, they're talking about things that are more important. So as you practice doing this, you'll start to get to do it a lot better. So I urge you to practice this when you do read any kind of article or news article or watch a video that's trying to give you some information. All right, on to the next thing here. Oh. Logical fallacies. Now, a logical fallacy is a error in reasoning that makes your argument invalid or not even good anymore. I can go way back to when you're a little kid and you said, Mommy, but Billy's doing it and Billy's mommy lets him do it. And of course, what your mom always said, if Billy jumped off a cliff, would you all also jump off a cliff? Well, this is a logical fallacy. You made a mistake in logic thinking that because one person did something, you could do it. Or if a group of people could do something, you could also do it. This is a logical fallacy, because what if the group were wrong? 
that's possible. So it's a logical fallacy that, and it's called bandwagon because everybody else is doing it, I can do it. There are lots of logical fallacies, but next video I want to teach you some of the most common ones. Now you can take your quiz and practice. Have a good day. Alt tab, alt tab, alt tab, and